So I've got my coffee again here today. This is my first for the day and I'm really excited to be sharing it with you guys because today we're going to talk about St. Francis of Assisi. Most of us know that there is a patron saint of animals or pets and the environment, creation, and if you don't, well there is. And his name is St. Francis. We're going to talk about his journey today. I'm going to share it with you. He's honestly one of the saints that is, when you think of someone who's like really holy and wonderful, you're like, oh yeah, all the saints are like that. But in reality, there's some real major twists and turns in his life. Um, I'm really excited to share that with you. Again, it's the third time I'm saying that. It's like, it's just, he's a really cool guy. So the first thing we have to know about Coffee of Saints <laughs> is that I read you guys a story that I've printed off. I like to get on major tangents um, and if I don't have it right in front of me it gets really crazy. So I'm going to read you his story and uh, it's going to be a, a fun and wild ride. Start by doing what's necessary, then what's possible, and suddenly you're doing the impossible. St. Francis of Assisi. The first thing we must realize about St. Francis is that he was a rebel by nature. Francis was born in 1181 in Assisi to a father who was a rich cloth merchant and a mom who was a beautiful French woman. Francis didn't want for anything during his youth. He was spoiled, indulging himself in fine wines and foods, and he's known for his wild celebrations. By the age of 14, he had left school completely and became known as a rebellious teenager. He drank, he was flirtatious, he partied, and he very frequently broke the city-wide curfew. In these privileged surroundings, St. Francis learned the skills of archery, horsemanship, and wrestling. He was expected to follow his father into the family trade at the time as being a son to take over the business once his father passed away, but he really didn't want to. He thought that life would be really boring and nothing like the exciting life of glory and women and twists and turns that he wanted. So instead he wanted to become a knight, which are like the action heroes of the medieval times. He wanted to be a war hero, just like them. And actually it wouldn't be long before Francis had the opportunity to become one. In 1202, war broke out between Assisi and Perugia, and Francis was like right hot on getting into the cavalry lineup with all of the other people that he knew. Um, he didn't really expect though that war would not be anything like what he daydreamed war would be about. Um, and uh, he didn't even realize that something really major was going to happen in his life that would completely change the direction he was wanting it to go in to something totally different. Francis, who was now about 21, and all the men in Assisi um, went into battle and they were very outnumbered. Um, they took heavy, heavy, heavy casualties and they retreated in flight. And in the midst of it all was Francis. And as he was there, the per Perugian troops came through and killed most of the surviving men from Assisi. Now Francis was probably really terrified. He was completely unskilled. This was his first battle and he, he was uh, probably going to be put to death. But uh, as Providence maybe would have it and the twist of his life was that he was wearing really expensive new flashy armor. Remember his father was really rich. And so the enemy saw that and were like, hey, we can get some ransom for him if we keep him alive. And so they didn't kill Francis. Instead, they led him off with some of the other rich men to a really dark, dirty, gross, wet dungeon to wait for, he was there for about a year with, with ransom negotiations with his father. They say during this time, he probably contracted a really serious disease and he would later report that he began seeing visions from God. In 1203, a year after negotiations began, Francis was released from prison when the ransom was accepted. When he came back to Assisi, Francis though, not surprisingly, was a very different man. 
Upon his return, Francis was really sick, both mentally and physically, as can be expected from someone who's been in a casualty of war. One day, as legend has it, Francis was riding through the countryside and came upon a leper. Prior to the war, Francis would have ran in the other direction on his horse or um, went by really, really swiftly. Lepers, let's remember, leprosy is a really contagious disease, especially, uh, and in those times, they would force the lepers to completely leave towns and villages and to live by themselves with the disease so it didn't take over the whole population. But on this particular occasion, Francis acted a little differently. Viewing the leper as a symbol of moral conscience, Francis instead got off of his horse and went to embrace the leper, choosing to see that this leper was Christ incognito. After this incident, Francis um, is said to have spoken about how his previous lifestyle of um, daydreaming and drinking and women and partying really lost all of its appeal. It didn't have any strong meaning for him anymore. And instead he felt this freedom when he left it all behind and embraced a new way of thinking. Francis now in his 20s began spending more and more time with God and less and less time working for his father. He would run away, not really run away, but he would escape to and find time to go to little remote mountain churches and spaces where he could be in prayer and isolation. And he would also spend time with the lepers, the ones that nobody wanted to be around nursing and caring for them. During this time, while in San Damiano, in front of an old Byzantine crucifix, Francis reportedly heard the voice of God, who told him to rebuild his Christian church and live a life of extreme poverty. Francis obeyed and he entirely devoted his life to Christianity after that. After his epiphany in the church of San Damiano, Francis had another major life moment. He went to and sold a bolt of cloth from his father's shop along with his horse to pay for some money to physically rebuild the church in the area. And his dad became really mad at Francis for selling what was not his property. And he uh, subsequently dragged Francis over to the local bishop and was like, hey, there's a problem on my hands. Because we also have to remember at the time too that the church really was um, the political and government at, um, upheld political and government ideals and standards. So if there was something wrong, you went to the church. The bishop told Francis to give back the money that Francis had taken, and uh, his reaction was a little bit extraordinary. Um, he said he would return the money, but also stripped completely naked in front of the bishop and his father inside of the church where they were meeting, and he gave it all over to his father and said that he no longer would recognize him and his father. Instead, God would be the only father that he recognized. Um, and they say that after this moment, there's no record of Francis and his father ever speaking again. The bishop gave Francis a rough tunic and dressed him in humble clothes and Francis went on his way. The saint, the future saint of Assisi took um, God's words very, very seriously. Believing that the poor are blessed and that if you have two coats, you should give one away. After breaking ties with his family, Francis had begged for stones to physically try and rebuild the church in the area. Francis uh, told his friends that he planned to marry Lady Poverty and he began spending more time preaching. Others began to follow him, and Francis found the rule of life in the words of Jesus in the scriptures, the command to the rich young man, sell his belongings and give to the poor, and to the apostles to take nothing on their journeys, and for to take up our cross and to follow him. And Francis asked his brothers to live in that way. If we refuse the material blessings we've given to our parents, or gave away our parents' savings to the church, um, they'd likely probably be really angry and confused with us as well. And um, just like Francis's father was, and our, in our relative wealth and comfort, it's really easy to forget that sometimes the call to Christianity and to be a Catholic, a real strong Catholic, is to do the rebellious thing we get so comfortable in life. And it's kind of like how we might see the saints as being these models of holiness and peace and whatnot. But quite honestly, a lot of the times they were quite rebellious going against what um, the norms of everything 
were. They stay true to what God asked them to do though, and therefore they become the role models of the church in our lives today. Francis's embrace of Christ, uh, like poverty, was a radical notion at the time. The Christian church was extremely wealthy, as well as the people who were leading the church. And this concerned Francis and many others. They felt that the long-held Christian values and traditions were being left behind and eroded away. And Francis took upon himself the mission of going out and restoring the original Jesus, or Jesus' original values. With his incredible charisma, Francis drew many, many followers. And they listened to Francis' sermons and joined his way of life, and his followers became known as the Franciscan Friars. Continually pushing himself to spiritual perfection, Francis constantly was preaching. He preached about a emotional, personal Christ, and this was a really new concept for people, one who, uh, a Christ who was with and for the people, not someone who was above the people. He even went so far as to preach to animals, which garnered criticism for all those around him and earned him the nickname of God's Fool. But the most impressive story revolving around St. Francis and animals was when he tamed a wolf that was terrorizing people of the town of Gubbio. Francis was staying in the town and he learned of a wolf so ravenous that it was not only killing animals and eating animals but the people in the town as well. The people took arms up and went after it but all those who encountered the wolf were perished and were killed and the, eventually the villagers became too afraid to leave the walls of their city. Francis had pity on the people and decided to go out and meet the wolf. He was desperately warned by the people not to go, but he insisted that God would protect him. Francis and his companions began to walk out of the village, and suddenly the wolf came out, charging at him with his teeth flared, and Francis stopped, made the sign of the cross, and said, Come to me, brother wolf. In the name of Christ, I order you not to hurt anyone. And at that moment, it is said the wolf lowered his head and lay down at Francis' feet, meek as a lamb. Francis explained to the wolf that he had been hurting the people in the village, terrorizing them and killing them, not just the animals, but humans as well who were also made in the image of God, just like him, the wolf. Brother wolf, said Francis, I want you to make peace between you and the people here. They will harm you no more and you must no longer harm them. All past crimes are forgiven. Then Francis commanded the wolf to follow him into the town and make a peace pact with the townspeople. The wolf meekly followed St. Francis. When the wolf, with the wolf at his side, St. Francis gave the townspeople a, a sermon on the wondrous and fearful love of God, calling them to repent from all of their sins. From that day onward, the people kept the pact they had made. The wolf lived for two years after that, going from door to door in the town and receiving food. And he hurt no one and no one hurt it and they say even the dogs did not bark at the wolf. When the wolf finally died of old age, the people were sad. The wolf's peaceful ways had been a living reminder uh, to them of the wonders, um, patience, virtues and holiness of St. Francis. And, it had been, and the wolf had been a living symbol of the power and providence of God. Is there something about this popular image, image of St. Francis preaching to the birds and the animals um, that obscures what he was really about? He wasn't Snow White. St. Francis didn't really love uh, my cats or maybe your dog or fish or gerbil. Um, but he was a man who loved the God who created all the cats and the animals and the dogs and the fish and the trees and the sunsets. Um, you have to put it into that time that the people there in the medieval ages were scared of everything. They were scared of a little noise, of darkness, and they were all afraid of going to hell for the smallest of things. Um, and what is unique about Francis is that he was able to share with them um, a God that was not judging and someone 
who was welcoming rather, a warm fatherly God. It was a subtle transition and most people didn't get it. Um, and he, he loved the God who created nature, not the God of nature. In his writings, Francis actually chastises birds and animals every once in a while for being too noisy while the friars were praying. Francis was not wrong to see the face of God in all creation, and we have really should be like him, being stewards of the earth and um, recognizing that through nature, God reveals himself to us. Later in his life, Francis felt called to take the gospel to the Muslim lands. He set out towards Syria during the Fifth Crusade, and Francis made his way straight to the Sultan. Fearlessly, he shared the gospel with his enemy, and while there's no record of conversion, um, Francis established a peaceful relationship between the Muslim world and the, uh, that had far-reaching consequences. In 1224, Francis reportedly received a vision from Christ in which he came away from with the uh, stigmata, wounds that um, reflect the wounds that Christ had in his passion, so the nail piercing in his hands and feet and a mark on his chest where the lance would have been driven through Jesus' side. This made Francis the first person in the world to receive the stigmata and they would remain visible for the rest of his life. Because of his earlier work with lepers, some believe that the wounds may have actually been symptoms of leprosy. We'll never know for certain. What we do know though is that Francis was a really, really was a, was a man entirely devoted to God, and there is no saying that God did not allow him to have the ability to carry those wounds, but there's also the possibility that if it was leprosy, Francis was able to take that, um, the pain and the suffering, and mirror it, and try to embrace every day the responsibility that Jesus would have had and because he loved God so much he wanted to be able to experience it so he could project that love onto others as well. Saint Bonaventure, an early Franciscan leader and theologian in his Life of Saint Francis, describes Francis as being more inflamed than usual with the love of God as he began a special time of solitary prayer on Mount Laverna in September 2012. 1224. Francis's unquenchable love for the good Jesus, Bonaventure writes, was fanned into such a blaze of flames that many waters could not quench such a powerful love. What did St. Francis experience? The simple servant of God understood the unimaginable love of God. A love that holds nothing back from us, not even God's only son. Many religious thinkers see this as the secret to Francis' spirituality, namely Francis' profound understanding of God's love for us. As Francis approached his death, um, many predicted that he was a saint in the making. When his health began to decline more rapidly, Francis returned to Assisi. He was actually, Assisi sent guards to watch over him to make sure that nobody from the town, uh, neighboring towns, would try and carry him off, which is, um, <laughs> I guess, something that we, we wouldn't experience it here and now. Um, but the body of a saint was considered to be really holy and brought reverence and people to the town in which the saint passed away in. And so he was an extremely valuable even as he was dying. So they had to send guards to make sure he didn't uh, get stolen away in the night. Francis died on Dece October 3rd, 1226 at the age of 44 in Assisi, Italy. Today, Francis has a lasting uh, resonance with millions of followers across the globe. He was canonized as a saint just two years after his death on July 16th, 1228. St. Francis of Assisi is the patron saint of ecologists, a title honoring the a title honoring his boundless love for animals and creation. Francis's lifestyle invites us to some embrace simplicity and to care for the church, the earth, and one another. That doesn't always take the form of grand gestures. As Mother Teresa said, sometimes we're called to do small things with great love and simply to do the next right thing day after day. We may want to be as radical and life-changing and world-changing as St. Francis, but maybe prayerfully choosing to love in everything we do is the kind of action that will change the world. That's what Francis did. And almost a thousand years later, we're still talking about his incredible life. Isn't this the holiest way to live? Well, to live like a monk and like St. Francis? I don't think so. There is no holiest way to live. Becoming a monk or a nun is the best way to live if that's what God has called you to be. 
and to do. But God's call is different for each of us. The holiest way to live is to follow the calling that God has given to you specifically. And so there we have St. Francis of Assisi. I know this, this is just a small story of his life and for someone who lived for 44 years, there's probably endless and boundless things that I missed. So I definitely encourage you that if this was something you're like, oh, this guy seems pretty interesting, um, maybe look him up, maybe get a book on him. I'll leave some um, resources you can find at the end of this video and you can just screenshot that, um, but yeah. Let's, uh, let's uh, all pray to St. Francis today to watch over us and guide us and um, for us to really relish and embrace the nature and creation that God has made all around us a lot, and uh, we are gifted with being a part of. So maybe today look out your window and stare at some trees or grass or leaves. Um, take a look at your pets and the people around you and just ask St. Francis to instill in you the awe that he felt when he saw the creation of God. And even at yourself, look at yourself in the mirror today and just be like, wow, I am loved. So yeah, that's St. Francis. Um, St. Francis, pray for us. I hope you guys enjoyed his story and uh, let me know if there's someone else you want to hear about. And uh, have a good day.